intervening period. So we had, I don't know, 2.7 or 2.75 people per house, and now we're down to like 2.6 or something. That, that's the reason that there's a difference between the household, the annual household and the per capita. I think better, though, in per capita. So I, I, I will be presenting more about uh, capital water use. And I think that the per capita numbers generally will be more easily applicable if you're trying to use these values to, to be things closer. Finally, the green is sort of what I would view as an efficiency benchmark that we can look to in the future. Uh, Aquacraft did a study of high efficiency homes that I worked on in 2011 that found that you know over about 40 or 50 houses, just by replacing the toilets and clothes washers and showers and faucet aerators in the bathrooms, you could reduce water use down to below 40 gallons per person per day indoors. That is a readily achievable. Uh, value. I, many people uh, across the country are already using that level and lower. Uh, and, and I think that this is, it's not unreasonable to expect that most of our citizens over the next 20 years are going to get somewhere in that neighborhood of 40 gallons per person indoors. Okay, so this, this compares sort of fixture by fixture the, the per capita water use changes that we've seen from the 1999 study to the 2015 or 2016. It keeps changing, they keep punching out the, uh, the, the release date, so I think I made the slides on the thought it was coming out in 2015. It actually is gonna be released this month. Uh, the, the, the little whisker bars up on top of, I don't know if you can see those, but those indicate, if, 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 if there's separation between those bars, then it's a statistically significant finding, meaning that the difference in these two water uses is statistically significant and 95% confidence level, meaning that you know we think there's a real difference. It's not just variability in the data that's, that's causing this difference. So there's only three categories, though, for which we saw a statistically significant difference in per capita use. And those were clothes washers, toilets, and dishwashers. So this is this is important. So this means that yes, you know, shower use went down a little bit, but not enough that we can confidently say you know we are making a big difference in the shower. And the same is true for faucets. And I was very surprised. I expected this to find uh, that we were going to see some, some changes in faucets. Um, but really, really, uh, that, that hasn't changed. And it's, there's a number of different explanations for, for showering and, and, and faucet uses. I think the simplest explanation is that shower, in, in the shower, there's a certain amount of water that is needed to get the job done. <laughs> and particularly if you have long hair, uh, then you know, it, you, and you need a certain amount of water, uh, volume to rinse that hair. And reducing the flow rate, which is how we attack showers, you know, by reducing the shower flow rate, tends to lend, lead to longer duration showers. Uh, so, do you want to ask a question? I, I do. Is there any difference in the way you disaggregated by end use uh, in 2015 versus? No, I got to use the exact same approach. It's the same software. Same software, yeah. I mean, just an upgraded version of the software. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. yeah. You know, it, 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 also, I don't want to, the, the precision of the analysis, the most precise analysis is for the categories of toilets, clothes, washers, and dishwashers. Things that are mechanical can be very accurately done. Things that are human operated, faucets and showers, they tend to be a little bit looser, so there might be a little bit more. Uh, fluctuation or, 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 or you know, perhaps error in some of that. The, the leakage is an important area. Leakage, leakage went down, but not in a statistically significant amount. I do think leakage is an area where we're going to make real progress on in, in years. And, and I'll talk about how we're going to do that, but it's really going to come through, through our meter data and, and our ability to identify people with high leaks very quickly. And it's, it's tremendous and powerful. I've, I've started to see utilities that have been implemented. Um, dishwashers. Dishwashers are such a small water use. You know, it's like I'm glad that they're getting more efficient, but the, the actual volumetric savings is, is almost insignificant. One thing that you know, in the earlier study, we had a finding that suggested people with dishwashers use less water for faucets then, because presumably they were washing their their dishes in the dishwasher. This time around, we did not find that. We found no difference in faucet water use between houses that had the, the dishwasher and houses that didn't. So be that as a way. So it doesn't seem like the dishwasher saves you on, on your, your faucet. But they are getting more efficient. Yes. What about the thing that they say that 
washing dishes in the dishwasher is more efficient than washing them in the sink. Yeah, so that's a separate question. Yeah. yeah. And, it, but if that were really true, you would think it might come out in this, you know, comparing <coughs> water use, faucet water use in houses with and without dishwashing and, and you know, correcting for the number of people. I, I think. If I could inject there, I've been corrected often because I didn't rinse my dishes before I put them in the washer. A lot of people clean them all off in tap water and then put it in the dishwasher. Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, this, this is the kind of thing that I'll leave it to other researchers. They really want to get down in the weeds. Uh, but but uh, it, it's, it, it's, it's important to understand uh, these trends and where, where we're making an impact and where maybe we're not making an impact. This shows the household and per capita hot water use. So for a select set of 90, we tried to do 10 houses in each of our nine cities that we monitored hot water use. That means we had the, the main meter, we had a data logger on the main meter, and we also had, we, we inst had a plumber come and install a water meter on the outflow line of the hot water heater. We put the data logger on that too. So we're recording two traces simultaneously, we're analyzing them in, uh, you know, together essentially and breaking out what water use is hot and what water use is cold. So the biggest user of hot water in the house is the shower. And, and uh, the average per person per day hot water use was about 8.1 gallons per person per day per shower. Uh, faucets were next, that's about seven gallons. Then way down, this one surprised me too. I thought clothes washers used a lot more hot water, but I, I think people really don't use that. They maybe use a warm water or cold water setting mostly. Clothes washers are not a big user of hot water at all. Um, and then, you know, it goes on down. The bath, baths, if you have a household where people really take a lot of baths, and have kids, whatever, uh, then, then you know, that, that's, a, that's a category that can be very variable. But on average, people don't bathe. You use the bathtub very much. On average, they use the shower way more than the bathtub. So it, it just becomes a, a fairly small end use. People have asked me about you know, these giant jetted tubs you know, that we've seen installed in houses and have, hasn't that increased bathtub water use? Honestly, we haven't seen that. I don't, I, I don't know if people don't, you know, those things are just for show. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe they take someone to fill, uh, whatever it is. They, 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 you know, in the future, it certainly it may become an issue, but it hasn't so far. Um, so anyway, overall, for household, you know, I, I, if, if you, when you get the report, we have hot water use broken down for household, for capital, all different ways. But on a for household basis, it was about 45, 45 gallons per household per day. Uh, so again, if you're thinking energy and water efficiency together, you got to think about this close one, the, the shower and the faucet as the big thing. But then you look at the data and say, well, we haven't made a big, big inroads there. So there may not be as much uh, savings in, in hot water uh, energy efficiency as we have been led to believe. All right, next slide, please. All right, let's talk about the how, let's, let's pat ourselves on the back for how we've gotten better. And this, this talks about some of the efficiency improvements we've seen. So in, in the 1999 study, we set up some very, very uh, hot, I consider them not very efficient benchmarks. So for the clothes washer, we said if you have an average clothes washer volume, 30 gallons per less, we're going to call it efficient. And so in the 1999 study, there were only 6% of our houses that whose the, where the average clothes washer volume was below 30 gallons. Now, the, and that, in that study, overall, the average clothes washer used about 40 gallons. Or, and, and we saw clothes washers that used upwards of 60 gallons per load. In the new study, and this is really the, the I call clothes washer the heavyweight champion of water conservation right now. Uh, you know, 46% of the houses now have a clothes washer that, that uses less than 30 gallons per load. Many, many houses had a clothes washer that used under 20 gallons per load. And we saw, we saw um, an average, you know, I think the average load volume went down to 30 uh, in, in the new study. I think 20 is a, is a likely achievable, 20 gallons per load is, is something that almost everybody who has a clothes washer is going to get to. Uh, we have the energy, uh, the energy star program has put into effect, you know, a series of ratcheting uh, measures that, that are going to reduce the, uh, the water use, I believe, of clothes washers significantly. Uh, so this, and we're, you know, 30, 30 gallons per load is not a very efficient benchmark. Toilets, we have, a, we have a lot of, uh, we made progress, but we still got a long way to go too. We set the efficiency benchmark at 2.2 gallons per flush, which is way above the 1.6. Uh, 
In, in 1999, only 5% of the homes met that criteria. Today, 37%. But that means we still got, what, 63% of the houses that don't even need a 2.2 gallon per plus criteria? That's, that's, that, is, uh, that is savings to be had. Showers, the, the Energy Policy Act sets 2.5 gallons per minute as the flow rate for a shower head. So if you go to Home Depot and you buy a shower head, you cannot buy one that, that uses uh, more than 2.5 gallons per minute. Now, you can take it home and pull out the air, uh, you know, the flow restrictor, and then it'll use more. Uh, but, you know, in 1999, we found that most people were already showering at 2.5 gallons per minute or below. Even if their, even if their shower head was capable of flowing higher, we found people a lot of times just ratcheted it down. It was just they preferred, that was just a preferred flow rate. So we didn't see a big change um, in, in the, the improvements uh, or the number of people who were, who were showering at lower flow rates. Next slide, please. Question. Yes, absolutely. Please feel free. I think it's great to, to jump in. I'm the third one in line, so if you can tell me, sorry, bro, yes, there. Were those measured or were those labeled uh, benchmarks that you had to buy? I'll go back in a second. Here. <laughs> so no, no, we, we use bench, this is how we this is how we queried our database essentially. So we uh, we took the, we calculated the average clothes washer volume for each of the 762 houses, and if it was less than or equal to 30 gallons, they got into one bin. If it was greater than 30 gallons per load, they got into another. Basically, the label the manufactured volume for that. No, no, the measured volume had nothing to do with any manufactured volume. This is actually what we measured at the meter. At the, this is how much so these. Yes, yes. So this is how it was being operated by the user. Because you know, a clothes washer, you can slide, you can set it up for a large or small load, I and mean, there's all kinds of variabilities now. So this is based on, you know, not based on manufacturer numbers. No, this is actually measured measured volumes. Okay, next. All right, let's look at outdoor water use. Now, the outdoor water, the way we did the outdoor water use analysis in this project was not from the data logger. So the data loggers were in place for only two weeks, completely insufficient for measuring outdoor. The way we measured outdoor water use is from the annual data that was provided for these households. And then we used the data log data as a very accurate measurement of the indoor water use. And then, so then we basically do a subtraction. We say, okay, let's imagine that, that indoor water use continued throughout the year consistently, you know, subtracted from the annual use. That is our best available estimate of outdoor water use. Then we went to our uh, GIS and mapping effort, and we very carefully uh, outlined every single property. We took out the house, the footprint, we took out the driveway, we took out any other hardscape that we could see from these very detailed aerial photos, and we constructed a water budget, essentially, a, 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 land, a landscape area, and then an estimate of how much water, based on the climate for that particular year where we had the data, how much water would be needed to irrigate this particular landscape reasonably. Not excessively, but reasonably. And then we said, okay, that's, that's, our, that's our water budget. That's, our, that's our sort of our theoretical estimate of water requirement. How much did they actually use? And this graph points us, uh, shows us a distribution of the water. So I'm going to do my Phil Donahue thing and move over here. Um, so the, the, the key takeaway here is right here. There is a lot of people who are under irrigating. They're who are not irrigating. That's sort of what we're low irrigation. That is the majority of the people in this study. Who were, who they, they were doing even better than fine. I mean, some people just, you know, outdoor water use, which is not part of their portfolio. We had another group in the middle who were, you know, pretty much right on target. And then a smaller group that trailed out that were irrigating excessively. Now, what was kind of amazing to me about the excessive group is even though it was a small number, let's go to the next slide. Um, so there was only there was only 12 and a half percent of the houses that were irrigating excessively. But if we summed up that volume of excess irrigation, it was enough to basically push everybody up into an excess category. It, it was so massive. So really these are the people that you gotta focus on. You know, and, and, and if you were if you were to go and offer you know some type of a rebate or a, or an incentive program to someone like this, you might actually lose their water. You might do something that you don't necessarily have no intention of doing uh, because they're already so low. My my advice to, to water utilities is you really got to mine your data on outdoor water. So you need to be able to identify the excess irrigators 
and just focus on those guys. And you, you know, you can identify new ones every year, um, but but leave the the, the low irrigators alone. And and uh, yes. Look at when I go to the city, San Antonio, Austin, some of those have fairly restrictive lines, water schedule. Did you look at those to see? The, you know, we uh, some of our cities had those schedules and some of them didn't. This this incorporates all of that. You know, so you know, we you, we you, we could, we have the data from from uh, San Antonio. City, so San Antonio would look particularly at their data, and they might have a different percentage that was in the excess. I don't, I don't remember what their specific results were. All right, next slide. So I've talked a lot about the residential <clears throat> sector. I do think it's important to recognize that we've increased efficiency in many other areas of water use, and certainly the commercial sector. Has, has increased um, both outdoors and indoors, um, the institutional sector, industrial. Um, and the, the final point on water loss, I think is extremely important. And, and uh, it's been very much on my mind as I've been working in Colorado at the state legislature to try and get a bill through that would uh, be a, pass a similar legislation what Texas has for, for water loss control to require use of the AWWA M36 methodology and, and standardized reporting method. Um, water, I, I really think water loss is, is going to be and it's really essential area for the utilities to focus on. Um, we've got a lot of potential still in, in our residential sector, you see, but we've also put things in place that are going to get us to the savings. Uh, and with water loss, we, do, we don't have that same thing. We need, we need a more active measures and really focus on it in a way, I think, in order to get the savings uh, there. And, uh, and, and you, we, it's not possible to set measures in place like we have on, on, the, on the customer side that, that are going to get us there off that. Uh, so let's talk about the big conundrum of water conservation, <laughs> you know, which is you know, and, and it's like, I, yeah, you asked me to save water, I save water, and suddenly you're slapping me with a rate increase. Uh, and so let's go to the next slide. You know, my, my, my comment on this is, is that conserve water or don't conserve water, your rates will go up. And the argument that's hard to make, but you need to make it, is if you conserve, and if conservation really is the lowest cost source of new supply, your rates are going to go up less than they would go up if you had to, to build that more expensive supply. It's not an easy message. I wish there was you know, a, a quicker way to say it. But really, the conundrum is this. Are you just, this, this, is not, this is just broadly applicable. You know, these numbers are not exact for any particular utility. But your cost, generally, a utility's cost is 20% variable and 80% fixed. And many utilities have rate structures where their revenue is 90% variable based on you know the, the, the rate they're charging for the commodity and only 10% fixed. I would argue that in the future we're going to have to change that fixed portion. We need to we need to increase that fixed portion, collect more steady revenues, and just understand that our consumption is going to go down and that we're going to need to collect that revenue anyway. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, ironically, we may end up saying, you know, the error of this, you know, sort of block rates where all of our revenue was, was in these high blocks, that, that might be a very short error in the water industry, and we may find ourselves moving in. I still think we're going to have increasing block rates that are going to play a very important role, but I also think the role of that fixed charge is, is very essential. All right, next slide. So, uh, if, you're, if this is a, if something you're interested in, I did some work for the Alliance for Water Efficiency. Uh, with the city of Westminster, Colorado, and, this, and, and we did an evaluation that you can do for your utility as well, where we looked at what is the real impact of conservation on rates in that utility. And the way that we did that is we said, well, what if they hadn't conserved water? What if they, let's, we went back to 1990, and we said, you know, if Westminster just, let's imagine none of this conservation had occurred. Their per capita use from 1990 continued on uh, till today. What would their water rates be? Well, it was astonishing. Basically, because of all of the additional infrastructure and water supply and everything else that they would have had to build and buy, their water rates would be 95% higher today than they are, even though the rates have gone up every year because, you know, that's what they do. But they would have been 95% higher. And actually, I just talked to the best on the phone. He said they've just updated it. It's now 105%. 
because their, their demand is continuing to go down. Their tap fees would have to be 80% higher than they have, they have tap rate. Anyway, I'm, I'm just giving you the punchline. This, we did a, an analysis, and we now have a, an approach that can be easily applied. So this is something, this is the data that your, that your decision makers need when, they, when you were going to them with a rate increase. And you're saying, we need an 8% rate increase. And they're saying, oh my gosh, you know, how can we support this you know, with, you know, in, in light of conservation? You need to have this type of analysis to say, yeah, you know, it's because our costs are going up, you know, as everyone's are. And, but honestly, we have been doing the lowest cost approach to the water supply plant. And, you know, our rates are lower than they would have been otherwise. Next slide. So the, the, this is really the, the, the takeaway. The cheapest water, generally, by far, is the water that you already have. And that's particularly true, you know, in, in particular, in, in have to look at purchasing or transporting all that into your Next slide. All right, let's talk about the future. I think we have a lot of conservation potential still out there. The numbers to me suggest that, yeah, we've done really well, and we've, we've decreased demand substantially, but there's still a tremendous amount of old mixtures that are still out there, and, and the results in the end study really confirm that. So I would say we're almost halfway there. Uh, so, so you know, we have not we have not gotten I think, even to the full fifty percent of our of our uh, conservation potential at this point. New technology is going to play a huge factor. It has already, uh, and, and I think in toilets we're probably getting down to the technical minimum where we're not going to be able to get much lower. You know, once we have a change of sewer systems, which is not going to happen. Um, other areas, though, clothes washers and, and other indoor end uses, I think there are probably are some additional technological approaches that. That uh, will have a benefit, but I really think outdoor is where we're going to see uh, substantial uh, change, and, and that's where things like water rates and technology, soil sensors, and um, I'm going to talk about the kind of the Rosetta Stone for the future of water conservation. I think that utilities are starting to take the approach of giving customers the information about how much water they use. And, and comparing that to if that's a reasonable amount, comparing to their neighbors, comparing to an efficiency benchmark. I think this type of approach that compares actual use to uh, some kind of a water budget, or a theoretical water budget, is tremendously powerful. But that's just the start of it. The next aspect is really advanced metering when, when utilities can start collecting data from customers more regularly. So once you have a more regular, uh, you know, an hourly or even a daily they uh, read from that water meter, you can look for changes. You can look and see, well, wow, you know, the, that, the water never turned off all night long in that house. Maybe they have a leak. And uh, I'm working with a community uh, in Westchester County, New York. I mentioned the work in New York that I'm doing. I'm, I'm doing conservation planning for uh, 10 communities in, in Westchester County that all buy wholesale from New York City. And one of them has, has actually implemented an AMI system where they're starting to do leak alerts. The, the change in water use in, in this East Coast city in one year was quite dramatic. I haven't done a detailed analysis on it, but it really does look like their leak alerts are having, having a substantial impact. And I think if, you know, that's, that's an area where water is not even on people's minds in the same way. So uh, I, I really believe that this potential for customer engagement and, and helping people to understand and get information when they want it, which is probably only when they have a problem, um, that, that's going to be very helpful. Next slide. So this uh, this one shows a little bit some of the examples, you know, how, how the AMI systems work and some of the, the different data approaches available. I think people are probably familiar with, with, with these. Uh, probably got salesmen knocking on your doors already. Um, but this this is an important uh, uh, development, I think. I think utilities probably uh, should take this on as much as they can sell and do it themselves as they can. Um, because I think that, that ultimately, you know, they're your customers and you, you, know, you want to be working with them directly. The next one. This is a graph. This is the first time I'm, I'm showing this chart. This, uh, and this is a, a graphic that I have worked on over the last few months to help people understand where, how water and water efficiency impact the overall system. And, um, so I, I put this up there today, hoping that people will take a look at it and maybe give me some feedback on it. But 
the, the, the thing, and this doesn't represent all utilities, but we tried to just design them in such a way that it would represent as many utilities as we possibly could. I think what a lot of customers don't realize is this aspect of it, that there is a tremendous return flow component to water use. And that, you know, saving some, some water savings increase that return flow and some decrease it. And, and ultimately, you know, if you're concerned about downstream users or things like that, you need to think about, you know, what, how much more water is getting back into the stream and, and, and a more integrated approach. This, I developed this graph along with the Open Water Foundation kind of help you and, and to communicate that to people. I'm not sure it's 100% successful, so I really would, if, if you have a chance to, to think about this and what might make it better, I would really appreciate it. Next slide. Okay, so I think I've mentioned most of these, and I think I'm going to wrap up pretty quick so we can get to some more questions. I do want to make a final point. I think we are going to, in order to get that next incremental water system, so we got, let's say, let's just imagine we got about half the potential. We, 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 I think that the, the water savings that we've gotten so far are probably the low hanging fruit, the easiest stuff. The next increment of savings will be more difficult. It's going to take more money. It's going to take more effort. It's going to take more staff, probably. Especially, and the more, and the farther along we go, you're going to be have to squeeze it even tighter. And, and that's where I think you're going to be doing demand management at that retail level, identifying those customers with high water demands uh, in comparison to to other customers, similar customers, and focusing on them. And I think that the idea of the water budget. Where you have, and this is not not about rate structures. This is just about a theoretical amount of water that makes sense for that property. That is a powerful concept. And comparing actual use to some sort of reasonable measure of water use is is uh, it's something that utilities, if they can do it for a large number of customers, that really guides their target and helps you know who are the people I should be working with and who are the people I can just move along with. Next slide. All right, this is just really a, a summary of uh, kind of the, the highlight. I, I think that the increased efficiency will make it predictable in the future. I think indoor in particular, you know, once we get down closer to everyone at 40 GPCD, it's not going to fluctuate as much. Uh, uh, outdoor use will still fluctuate tremendously with, with climate. That's always going to be. There's also always potential for higher water use. We have talked today about all the trends that are pushing water use down. There are going to be other trends that, are, you know, new technology, new devices, things that come around that might use more water. And we've got to keep our eyes out and, and pay close attention to that as well. And I think with that, I would be happy to answer any questions. Uh, I put my email up. I do a lot of uh, work for the Alliance for Water Efficiency. People frequently ask me questions, technical questions, and that is absolutely fair game. So if, uh, you know, if you think of something uh, and, you know, you want to, a question about the studies or water use or trends or anything like that, please feel free to reach out to me uh, you know, by email at a, at a future date. Thank you very much. I'm happy to ask questions. Thank you. Uh, on the residential outdoor water use slide, the, the left side vertical axis is relative frequency, and then you talk about this 12.5% for the excess. Irrigators. Yeah, let's go back to those slides. Talk about that a little bit. Sure, better. sure, sure. Let's, there's two slides, and, and I hope I labeled my axes correctly. Uh, okay, so then this is this is yeah. So so this this slide is, takes a, 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 a 838 houses in this sample, right? Twelve point five of those eight percent of those 838 were in the excess. That answer your question. 